evening and welcome to the continuing study of John Ortberg's If You Want to Walk on Water, You've Got to Get Out of the Boat, Pastor Paul Hassel, one of the assistant pastors here, I want to welcome you, thank you for joining us. We're going to continue, we're going to finish uh, chapter 3, starting on page 66, let me pray for us to start. Father, we thank you that you take our work seriously, that you have made us for yourself, and you have made us for um, meaning and purpose. And as we discern what it looks like to take um, risky faith and not foolish steps, as we uh, work to understand what discernment means, would you be giving us understanding, and would you be giving us the resources that we need, particularly the community that would offer the uh, wisdom and discernment uh, together with uh, care and prayerful reflection. So, Father, thank you that you are for us. Thank you that um, you want to give us the things that we need in order to not just survive, but to thrive. Um, And we thank you for this evening as we get to consider what it means to walk in risky faith. pray all this for Jesus' sake. Amen. So this, uh, this chapter is about discerning the call, and he starts with, um, there are ways that we can uh, talk about risky faith, and what we really could be meaning is just foolishness, uh, risk-taking for the sake of taking risks. And uh, what we want to do is take risky faith, things that are response to what God is doing, um, ways that he's inviting us to trust and to work with him uh, in ways that may stretch us, in ways that may uh, challenge our understanding and thinking, and that is the kind of risk that we want. And so he, um, he begins uh, by talking about taking the call seriously, uh, reflecting that we are uh, made in his image and honoring the raw materials. In the conclusion of that section, he quotes uh, Parker Palmer, who is writing about the myth of the limitless self. He says, uh, like many middle-class Americans, especially those that are white and male, I was raised in a subculture that insisted I could do anything I wanted to be anything I wanted to be if I were willing to make the effort. This message was both uh, It was both that the universe and I were without limits, given enough energy and commitment on my part. God made things that way, and I had all I had to do was to get with the program. My troubles began, of course, that when I started to slam into my limitations, especially in the form of failure. He says that many years after they occurred, the memory of those failures still holds the power to make me want to forget them and hide from them or explain them away. And the reason for some of those failures was not simply a lack of persistence or unfriendly circumstances, but I was slamming into my own limitations. It is a humbling thing for me to realize how often in my life my own need to be seen as a successful, strong, confident, charismatic leader has caused me to run from patient ex- explaining, uh, patiently explaining my failures and learning from them who I am and who I am not. So I think that uh, part of the setup for the Assembling Our Clearness Committee is recognizing that, that it is a myth to say that if we just had enough time, I worked on a, a Christian college up north and uh, all the students thought that they they could do anything, all they needed was enough time and enough of their effort. And that is simply not true. There are things that we cannot do. There are going to be things that we are just not good at, no matter how hard we work. Um, We are unique. We have personality. We have traits. We have gifts. We have interests. Um, we uh, We have skills, and skills can be developed, but we have propensities, and there are things that we just will not be able to do. And the part of discerning God's call to us in walking in risky faith is discerning the difference between uh, living out a myth that I can just do anything at all and living into 
what has God called me because of the way he has made me? And so um, Ortberg talks about a clearness committee. Likewise, one of the hardest commands in the scripture to obey is God is Paul's statement in regarding to ourselves to have a sober judgment, to come to an accurate assessment of my passions, gifts, limits, is one of the great challenges of life. In part, this command requires tremendous self-awareness, but I am also in need of help from other people to overcome my blind spots. And here at the Mount, we're talking a lot about this um, in our commitment to becoming more multi-ethnic. One of the ways it's not only individually do we have blind spots, but culturally we have blind spots, and the need and God's gift of diversity is to help us uh, be able to discern more clearly and hold on to the truth more clearly, more accurately, because we are helping one another overcome our blind spots. When I think of the value of receiving discernment from more than one person, uh, John is reminded of Bob Buford in his book, Halftime. He was a very successful businessman, and he felt like he was being invited to move into success from success into significance. So he and his wife, Linda, met with one advisor to help him clarify his sense of purpose. And that advisor suggested a questionable next step. He said, sell your company, invest in ministry-oriented projects that you have been talking about. Bob writes, I sat there stunned by the implication of this decision. Linda appeared no less stunned, and I could almost see the stereotypical images of ministry and missionaries and monasteries passing through her mind. Would we be philanthropic couple passing on our money until our sack was empty, or would we, and would we be required to dress like a minister and his spouse? Bob goes on to explain as he assembled his own clearness committee, though he did not use that language. Together they helped him see that, his, that what he most loved and he did best was strategic thinking and organiza- organizational leadership. And they discerned that if he were to sell his company, he would not have a platform that he could use to lever- leverage a great deal of good. Instead, they helped him see that his passion and competencies were ideally suited to help pastors and church leaders deal with issues of organizational complexity and missional effectiveness. Today, today he leads a ministry that develops leaders for key churches throughout the country. He loves doing it, but if he had run out and followed the Hearst advice Advisors Council, he would have sold his business and simply doled out the funds. He never would have experienced the effectiveness or the fulfillment that he now has today. In the Quaker tradition, a clearness committee does not come together to give advice. Lots of people want to do that without you even asking. It is certainly uh, that you don't need to have people who have their own agenda tell you, uh, uh, speak into your life. The primary job of the group is simply to ask questions, listen thoughtfully, and then pray for a sense of what God is calling in your life. I need people who can help me ask questions like, what do I enjoy doing for its own sake? What do I ne- avoid doing and why? What do I wish to be, re- what do I want to be remembered? How might you offer, uh, how might the offer of money or promotion sidetrack me from my true calling? And what would my life look like if I, if it turned out well? What does uh, living well mean to me? His advice here is uh, instead of jumping in, even though we do want to take risky faith, faith we want to conduct low-cost probes. Arthur Miller puts it this way. It is, is, it is wrong, it is a sin to accept or remain in a position that you know is a mismatch for you. Perhaps that's a form of sin that you've never considered, the sin of staying in the wrong job. But God does not place you on this earth to waste away your years in labor that does not employ his design or purpose for your life, no matter how much money, how much you are getting paid for it. Since discerning a call usually requires time and patience, and most of all, that bills have to be paid, what we can do while we what can we do while we're searching? 
the process is bad news for those who want to microwave everything, including your vocation. You may be tempted to jump in a commitment rashly. And this is the difference between foolish faith and risky faith. One alternative is to conclude what Bob Buford calls a low-cost probe. The idea is to keep your day job, but test the waters of a new calling. Begin to explore your effectiveness in an area which you believe God is calling you. In Bob's case, the low probe began through retaining his CEO position, but pulling together a group of pastors of large churches to see if they would benefit from the kind of organizational expertise he had been able to bring. This led him to finding his primary calling of the second half of his life, but the cost was low enough that he had, had it been a dead end, he could easily pivot to search somewhere else. Had he impulsively quit his job and taken off, taken a staff position at a church somewhere, he might have missed the calling and jeopardized his chance to keep searching. Further, Gordon Smith notes that discerning honors the previous decisions and commitments. God is a careful worker and does not waste our resources. The competencies and skills that you have acquired until now matter to him and may be squandered if you leave your current situation too quickly. Maybe for a low-cost probe, you could be involved in a short-term mission plunge or take a commitment to teach at your church or get involved as a volunteer launching a new ministry. Take confidence in the fact that the biblical precedent for launching a low-cost probe, Amos transitions into the prophetic business while still being a shepherd. Even Paul apparently kept his tent-making operation in production mode while he was still church planning. A call often involves pain. People sometimes romanticize the notion of vocation. Receiving a call from God is not the same as falling in love with your dream career. A dream career generally promises wealth, power, status, security, and great benefits. A calling is often a different story. God calls Mo called Moses. Go to Pharaoh, the most powerful man on the earth. Tell him to let his labor force leave without, comp without compensation to worship a God he doesn't believe in, and then convince a timid, stiff-necked people to run away into the desert. That is a calling. And Moses said, Here I am, send Aaron. God called Jonah, Go to Nineveh, the most corrupt and violent city in the world. Tell its inhabitants, who don't know you and won't acknowledge me, to repent or die. And then Jonah said, When's the next whale leaving in the opposite direction? God called Jeremiah to preach to people who wouldn't listen. It was so hard that Jeremiah cried so much that he was known as the weeping prophet. How would you like to be the CEO with that title? The sobbing CEO or the depressed, determ uh, the depressed determinologist. As a rule, the people whom you, we read about in scripture who were called by God felt quite inadequate. When God called Abraham to leave home, or Gideon to lead an army, or Esther to defy the king, or Mary to give birth to the Messiah, their initial response was never, yes, I'm up to that challenge, I think I can handle it. The first response to God's, a God-sized calling is generally fear. Henry Back Blackaby writes, some people say, God will never ask me to do something I can't do. I have come to this place in my life that if the assignment I sense God is giving me is something I know that I can handle. I know it's probably not from God. The kind of assignment God gives in the Bible are always God-sized. They're always beyond what the people can do because he wants to, determine, to demonstrate his nature, his strength, his provision, and his kind of kindness in his people to a watching world. This is the only way the world will come to know him. Where God calls, God gifts. But that doesn't mean that it's natural talent alone. Sometimes the calling, uh, I will need ideas, strength, creativity that's beyond my resources, uh, what God is asking me. And he's going to have to do that by bringing together people. He's not just calling us to work for God. He's calling us to work with God. Everyone in scripture who has said yes to their calling had to pay a high price. So will you, so will I. 
sometimes it will mean putting an, in hours of work and effort and when you have ra- when you would rather have not will you do it maybe your calling will not involve the kind of recognition or wealth or influence that you had always hoped for can you let that go Sometimes you will devote yourself to a dream like Jeremiah, and the things will not turn out the way you wanted, and you will experience crushing disappointment and discouragement. Can you persist? Sometimes along those lines, people will oppose you and disapprove of you or block what you are trying to do. Can you endure? Maybe it will take a long time to discern your calling. Maybe it will involve much trial and error and many false starts. Do you tend to be impatient? Be impatient, wanting immediate results? Will you be patient? Having a career versus a calling. American society does not talk much about calling anymore. It's more about, we're more likely to think in terms of a career. Yet for many people, a career becomes an altar in which they sacrifice their lives. Benjamin Honeycutt it is a historian who specializes in the history of work at the University of Iowa, and he noted that the work has become our new religion. We worship it, and we give it our time. As people's commitment to family, community, and faith are shrinking, they are looking to their career to provide with them for them meaning, connectedness, identity, and esteem. A call is something I do for God. It, was repl- it replaces a career which threatens to become my God. A career is something I choose for myself, calling is something I receive. A career is something I do for myself. A calling is something I do for God. A career promises status, money, or power. A calling generally promises difficulty and even some suffering, and the opportunity to be used by God. A career is about upward mobility. A calling generally leads to downward mobility. When I first went into pastoral ministry, people would sometimes ask me when I got the call, as if Church work required a calling, but marketplace jobs don't. They're just part of the career. But that is not how it goes. We all know that it is possible to turn turn church work into a career that's about advancement and achievement, and it's also possible to turn business calling into what is truly done to serve God and others. We need to understand the priesthood of all believers means everyone is called to ministry. And the call to ministry vocationally is for those who are gifted to equip God's people. But all people are called to ministry. A career may end with a retirement and lots of toys. A call-in is never over until you die. The reward of a career may be quite visible, but they are only temporary. The significance of a calling lasts for eternity. A A career can be disrupted by any number of events, but not a calling. Scripture is full of people who have pressed were pressed into slavery, captured, sent into exile, thrown into prison. Their career trajectory did not look promising, but they fulfilled their calling in extraordinary ways. Pharaoh had a career, but Moses had a calling. Potiphar had a career, but Joseph had a calling. Haman had a career, but Esther had a calling. Ahab had a career, but Elijah had a calling. Pilate had a career, but Jesus had a calling. And not just people in in Scripture. Chuck Colson, who was in the midst of one of the most high-profile careers in America, he was in the White House with Nixon, found uh, himself thrown in prison for his role in Watergate and its cover-up. But his calling was, was... was in a way, uh, his former career was finished, but his calling was just beginning. He would be able to serve men in prison like him. He would be called to serve the whole nation, both through his gifts and his brokenness. The real legacy of my life was my biggest failure, he writes, that I was an ex-con. My greatest humiliation, being sent to prison, was the beginning of God's greatest use in my life. He chose the one experience in which I could not glory for his glory. So as we think about our calling and we discern calling, 
we want to say we do want to take risky faith. But risky faith is not foolish. It's not rash. It's not jumping into something. It requires careful thought and prayer, and it also requires community. Um, as I was reading this, I was I was thinking about 1 Corinthians 14, where Paul says um, that we should de- earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially prophecy. And the importance of prophecy here, and the, what we need to understand about that word, is prophecy is not primarily telling for fortune telling, telling the future. Prophecy is truth telling, is discerning the circumstances, recognizing how God is at work, and being able to speak the timely word of God and applying the word of God written in our lives present. And so if the church were seeking the gifts of prophecy more, we would have the ability to discern and help one another follow our calling more accurately. So let us be wise. Let us be risky in our faith. Let us live as a prophetic community that we might serve God and live out his kingdom more effectively for Jesus' sake. I'm going to invite the that Minister Brown is on her way. She is going to give us a sermon. Um, so we're going to take uh, a moment as we transition to our next, what we're doing next. Uh, stay with us.
my brothers. My, bro my brothers and my sisters, uh, this evening as we uh, continue our worship experience today, we're going to have one of our ministers, Minister Kelly Parker, who's, I mean Kelly Parker Brown, who's going to be our uh, speaker this evening. Uh, there is, uh, I think it's Psalm 27, where it talks about, I look to the hill. Uh, 24, 27, which come of my help, all my help coming from thee. A look back, a look in, and a look forward. I mean, that's uh, something to think about in this time of Lent. When you really look at what's going on, we will uh, deal with uh, Palm Sunday this coming Sunday. But I uh, want you to be in prayer with Minister Brown. Oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved. to praise God. 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 So why, 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 why do you want to praise him? I laid down last night, woke up this morning, praise God. I started out on today's journey, praise God. Made it this far, praise God. And I got to lay down tonight, praise God. I might not wake up in the morning, but right now, praise God. And that old prayer that said, Lord, lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep, but if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God.
Hallelujah. Come on, let's give God some praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The songwriter says, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. And I thank God for saving me. Now that's enough to praise God for. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, I thank you for this opportunity that my pastor has given me in the task of bringing the lesson for this evening. Sermon, Sermon for this evening. Amen. 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 It's, a, it's enough for us in here to have a Holy Ghost good time on tonight. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. But before we get started, let's just say hallelujah. Give God some glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, I hear the angels praising God right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me, my soul cries out. Hallelujah. Thank God for saving me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're going to be coming from the um, scriptures, Matthew 26, 1, 14 through 16. And we're going to be talking on the subject tonight, Judas' betrayal of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father God, I come before you right now. I decrease as you increase in me. Help me preach, teach, speak this lesson, speak through me, dear God. I know what we together have put on this paper, but you can take over at any time. Father, I thank you and I appreciate you and I love you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hallelujah. As we were saying that our lesson scripture, our sermon scripture is coming from Matthew 26, 14 through the 16th verse. And if you have your Bibles, can you please turn to that scripture for me? Now, just let me get it. Matthew. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. 16 verse says, from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Amen? In our reference scripture, we're going to reference at some point Isaiah 53, Luke 9 and 44. And Luke 22, 1 through 6. I want to set this up for you right now. Imagine you you were, say, the leader of something and you needed to get 11 more people, 12 more people, 15 more people to be with you in this journey that you're doing. Say you're a travel agent, say you're a business owner, say you're a pastor. Say you just starting the ministry, but you but you want to seek out twelve people that you that you know that can help you carry this if something was to happen to you. Let's set this up. Okay, so I'm that person. I'm looking for twelve people. You're that person. You're looking for twelve people. You you know the number that you want because you already know you can do it with twelve. Amen. Because those twelve is gonna turn around and multiply in the end. But right now we're just looking for a specific number. But when you get to some people, you already know that somebody told you that you shouldn't pick that person because that person is going to betray you. That person is not worthy because that person has done it to somebody else. That person, it, it, they don't like you. But because of their skill, knowledge, and because of what you know that you can impartate in them, what you possibly can maybe change them from who they are, you choose them anyway. But in the end... They turned out to be what it was prophesied to be. I said all that to say this. Jesus picked 12 disciples. He picked 12. When he picked Judah, I can imagine him going like Jesus. God has already told me that this is going to be the one. But because scripture has to be fulfilled and because I 
gotta go, but I gotta impartate in the other 11 along with the one that's gonna betray me. I gotta keep moving. I gotta choose my betrayer. Anybody understand what I'm talking about tonight? Have you ever chose somebody on your team that you weren't quite satisfied with, but you knew that they would help you get to where you was going? All right. Amen? So this is what we're setting up tonight. If Jesus had not betrayed Jesus, if Judas had not betrayed Jesus, we may not even be sitting here today. Ah. We wouldn't be sitting here. He had to go to the cross. And my first point is ordained betrayal. It was ordained, prophesied, not so much of Judas betraying Jesus, but of what Jesus was going to go through when he got betrayed. Right. See, in Isaiah 53, it talks about he was bruised for our affliction. They say that he drug him from judgment hall to judgment hall. See, if you go back in, in Isaiah, it breaks down to you what Jesus had to go through. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. It was ordained by God for Judas to betray his Savior, our Savior. Jesus already knew he was going to be betrayed. He tried to share it with the disciples I don't know how early in the ministry that Jesus tried to portray this to the disciples, but in Luke 9 and 44, it states that Jesus told them that he's going to be betrayed. All right. Jesus said, I'm going to be betrayed. They're looking around like, who, God? <laughs> who who, who going to betray me? Jesus understood that they did not understand what he was saying. So it was hidden from them. According to the scriptures, he mentions this, his betrayal, three times in various gospels. Mark 14, 18 through 21, and Luke 22, 21 through 23, and in John 13, 21 through 30. In the gospel of John, it clearly tells us that Jesus knew Judas would betray him. Because of the scriptures, they had to be fulfilled. Jesus goes on to say, I know who I have chosen. If I can use my imagination, as I was trying to use earlier, Jesus had to, when he came to Judas, he probably said, oh my God, you the one. You the one finna set me up. You got to walk with me. You got to eat with me. You got to sleep with me. You got to talk with me. You're sitting on the choir. You're sitting on the usher boy. You're sitting in my pulpit. You got to be one of me until it's your time. But I'm going to go through this because you have to be the one to betray me. So Jesus was the one that basically prophesied, told his disciples, brought it forth that Judas was going to be the one to betray him. Amen? Hallelujah. Okay, he seems as if though Jesus, let me back up. I lost my place. He betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, which in today's time equivalent to $200. Mm. Back then, maybe it was a lot of money. I don't know. But here today, it's only $200. What have somebody betrayed you for? Or what have you betrayed somebody else for? Worth $200. My second point. And when I go into this point, please, 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 please let us examine us. Because God said to me, don't be the one. That's my second point. Don't be the one to betray Jesus. Don't be the one to betray your Christianity. Don't be the one to betray your pastor, to betray your boss, to betray your friend, to betray your husband, to betray your wife. Don't be that one. Luke 22, 1 and 6. Let's go there if we can, please. Luke 21, 1 through 6. 
As Jesus looked up, he said he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Now the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judah called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with him how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted, they were delighted and agreed to him to give him money. He consented. He consented. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Going back up to verse number three. Then Satan entered Judah. This gives an account of a betrayal. Satan enters Judah. Now this must have been a strange situation. Sitting next to Jesus, Satan was allowed to enter Judah. How can someone be that close to salvation, to God, to allow Satan to use them? Some say Judah's greed for money that left an opening for betrayal. He left an opening for Satan to come in. That lets me know that a person can't be sitting right in church, lying next to you in the bed, work, work, working with you, and even call them a friend. Husband or wife, sister, brother, mother, dad, having the potential to betray you. And guess what? You can too. I can too. We all have that potential to betray one another, another human being. And guess what, y'all? We all have a potential of betraying Jesus. Yeah. Examples. I want to give you some examples, some ways that we can be, that can be done, that you can betray somebody, betray Jesus. Pastor, I should do something. You say yes, but in your heart, you really don't. You're grudging, you're murmuring, you're complaining. God sees that. That's not true worship. It's not true service. And God is like, Satan is like, oh, I can just jump in there. That's one way that you can allow. And yet you're smiling in the pastor's face as if it's okay. But the devil is just waiting for opportunity for you to jump in, for him to jump in. He's already using, he's already setting you up. Another one, our spouse can be doing the best that they can do and all that they know to do, but yet we see the past mistakes that allows us to allow Satan to enter our hearts against us. That's another way that the enemy is setting you up to be used at work instead of being a team player with gossiping about our boss and secretly jealous of co-workers who are doing their best and doing what they're supposed to be doing on point, but you are allowing Satan to set you up to be betrayed. And once Satan gets into your heart, believe me, he sits there and he waits. He may not even move the first year. He may not move the second year. You might be sitting in a church for 30 years and all of a sudden, here comes Satan. It was three years that Judah sat and talked and walked and, and, and gleaned from Jesus. I'm sure Judas had some type, because he walked with them two by two, and they was laying hands on the sick, and they recovered, and he went out, and he did everything that Jesus told him to do. He was an obedient servant, but yet had a seed of betrayal in his heart. The Bible really doesn't disclose where it comes from. The Bible doesn't even disclose how he got it. But we do know the Bible discloses that Satan entered him the very night, the very night 
that Jesus was going to be betrayed. Jesus already knew. Like I said, let me break this down to y'all, though. Somebody sitting right here, finna get ready to betray me. She said, you know, ain't no shame in my game. I'm just gonna let y'all know, I know you, I see you. I see you. You're getting ready to betray me. Is it me? Is it me, Jesus? He go, Peter, I'll go, I'll go to prison for you, Jesus. I'll do too. Jesus had to shut him down too. That's another message. But Jesus had to shut Peter down. So he said, but when you get strengthened, strengthen your brothers. That's another message. Daughters against mothers. Sisters against sisters, sons presenting their fathers are ways the enemy has the opportunity to enter you. Don't be the one. Don't allow Satan to enter your mind. He loves to play with your mind, your heart, because like I just said, if he gets in your heart, it's almost over because your heart is like your soul. It, 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 mm. Your thoughts, especially those in the household of faith. Satan doesn't care if you go to church. He doesn't care if you read your Bible. He doesn't care if you are a minister, a deacon, a pastor, a bishop, in the choir, a greeter. He doesn't care if you give a lot of money in the offering. All of that doesn't even matter to him. He just waiting on opportunity. That's it. That's all. Hallelujah. Jesus was with Jesus. He walked with him. He ate with him. He slept with him, yet that was not enough. Who could be going through somebody's mind to to, to betray the Savior, to betray somebody who, when you first walked in the church, didn't have nothing. When you first came to the church, was just out there, and God gave you word. He built you up. He appointed you. He made you somebody. You're in the choir. You you, you can walk around with your head high, but you want to betray when you don't even know half the story. Mm. You, you want to portray when Jesus said, no, that, 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 you need that. This is somebody I put over you. You need that. Jesus came that he, that we might have life and have a more abundant you see, but the devil knew that if I can just get one of them and I can just plant one of them in there and, and that's going to destroy them, that that's going to take it all. It, it's all going to be done. It ain't going to be no more, no more, no more. But devil, you was a liar then and you a liar now. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Woo, it wasn't enough, but he still betrayed Jesus. How can we? Who are you eating with? Who are you walking with? Who are you sleeping with? Are you loyal? Are you the one who will betray trust? Betray your church with backbiting, with gossip, with double-mindedness? Are you the one? In my conclusion, hallelujah, God's will be Maybe some people think that God doesn't speak to his shepherds, that he has appointed over us, over his people. Just like Jesus, pastors know who is with them and who is against them. But just like Jesus, he keeps quiet. She keeps quiet. Everybody in here is not for the pastor. Maybe for reasons you can't even get over, but for God's glory, the will of God will be carried out. If you are a type of Judah, Sitting in the midst of a congregation, and it gets, hallelujah, and it can be more than just one person. Just do what Judas could have done. Judas took the coward way out. He walked away. Tried to go get a silver back. They didn't want it. Threw it back. They kept it, though. I think they threw it somewhere else or gave it something because they didn't want to put it in the church because it was blood money. He couldn't go, he felt like he couldn't go back and repent and and get it right, so he killed himself. But you out there, if you in your church or on your job or in your home or with your children got a 
spirit of betrayal on you. You can do what Judas didn't do. You can go to a living God. You can repent and ask God to give you a heart and take this stone heart away. God, give me understanding, not just reading the word, but understanding your word that I read. God, give me a prayer life. Give me a fasting life that I'm able to be building with my pastor, building on my job, building in my home, building with my children, not against them. Father, I ask you right now to take up anything in me, God. I ask you to take the betrayal spirit, that po- that potential, that potential. You ain't doing it yet, but because the seed is on the inside, you have the potential of betraying the one you love the most. Where or who it could be. But because we are in the household of faith. It is so many of us that are perpetrating a fraud, as we used to just say back in the day. Just sitting here, wasting time, when Jesus can come at any moment. God told me, he said, Callie, he said, you ain't doing what all you supposed to be doing. If you stay dormant, The enemy can come in and plant seeds, and you can be potentially betraying me. I don't want to be that person. You don't want to be the betrayer. You do not. And we can think we got it all together. Oh, that ain't me. What did everybody kept saying? Hey, was it me, Jesus? Is it me? Is it me? Is it me? Is it you? 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 Is it me? In my conclusion, the last thing I want to say, all you got to do is ask God to give you a pure heart. Don't allow Satan to remain in your heart. Because if you do, you leave room for him to overtake you like Judas did. For that moment in time and betray his Savior. God wants us to learn from this that we are at risk if we do not guard our hearts from evil thoughts and actions. That's my sermon for today. May God bless his word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Trouble in my way. I have to cry sometimes. Trouble in my way. I have to cry sometimes. I lay awake at night, but but that's all right. Cause I know Jesus. Jesus I know Jesus. Jesus I know Jesus. Jesus After a while, while. trouble in my way. I have to cry sometimes. Whoa, trouble in my way. I have to cry sometimes. I lay awake at night. Well, that's all right. Cause I know Jesus. Do you know He will? I know Jesus. I know Jesus. Stepped in the furnace. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I know that one too. Uh, thank God for uh, Minister Brown and the sermon. Great sermon. Uh, she was on point. Uh, have you portrayed Jesus? And uh, so as we prepare to close tonight, we hope and pray that you have not. But if you have portrayed Jesus in any way, you can go to him and repent, as she has told you, and be forgiven of your sins and get right with God. You know, get right with God. And do it now. Y'all know how to do that, right? That old hymn, get right with God. He will show you how. 
Our Father, in the name of thy Son, Jesus, help all of us to get right with God and stay right with him. We thank you for this time together in the word and the teaching of uh, Pastor Paul, the preaching of Minister Brown as we continue on Wednesday night. We look forward to this every Wednesday night. Next Wednesday night, before uh, Resurrection Sunday, before Easter, next Wednesday night, for those of you who may be sick, for those of you who may have a problem, for those of you who are struggling in the world, we want to have a delivering uh, and healing worship next Wednesday night. I want to invite you to come in and be with us as we pray together and as we worship together and and bless each other and anoint each other with the Holy Spirit and, and, and ask God to deliver and heal all of us from whatever it is that we're going through. So I want to encourage you to be ready. Get ready because God is still able to do anything but fail. So now may the grace of our Father, may the sweet, sweet, sweet communion of the Holy Spirit. Lord, let it rest. And don't just let it rest, but to these thy people that listen to the sound of my voice, let it rule in your life not just now but now henceforth and forevermore and all of god's people and all those who love god said amen amen and amen god bless you thank you for tuning in tonight we look forward for you to being here next wednesday night healing and delivering service right here as we're getting ready to move into resurrection sunday